I'm in Akron, Ohio at a phenomenal antique store here called The Bomb Shelter. I'm not sure how to describe this place, but the owner, Kevin, who I've just been talking to, has also got his classic cars in here as well. And this guy is really interesting. He's a big Citroen guy, but he's only got one of his Citroens in here. And um, I thought it would be a cool thing to actually come out here and talk to him and uh, see some of his cars and, and just walk around with you and show you what he's got in here. So without further ado, let's get inside now to this snow. I'm Darren and this is Auto Atlantica. So the moment that you walk in, you are greeted by this amazing 1990 Zastava Yugo Corral. This is not a US spec car. This is actually a domestic Yugoslav car. Um, that's in just phenomenal condition obviously it's a it's a left-hand drive this has got the 1100 cc overhead cam from the 128 in it you can see how basic that is obviously it's a manual gearbox these started at like four grand when they were for sale in the states as i said this is a corral it's a european spec model of course these were designed by zastava themselves they built the 128 under license. Um, they had built the old 600 and 500 under license as well. Um, but this was their own design and based on the mechanicals of the 127 primarily. And uh, they did use the 903 and the 1116cc engines in this. This has got the over, overhead cam. Of course, that 903 engine was replaced by the uh, fully integrated robotic engine version, the Fire, which was 999cc originally, and uh, then it spawned into a host of engines and ultimately became the multi-air version of which I have in my bath. But just look at the cleanliness of this thing, which is just astonishing. So the bomb shelter is 26,000 square feet of all sorts of knickknacks and antiques, ranging from this photo booth here to a bunch of old cameras, a lot of them old Kodaks. So that's another interest of mine. Uh, this is the uh, photography section. Um, ranging to old radios here from the 40s and 50s and 60s. And a whole plethora of LPs that I wanted to go through but didn't have time. Uh, depression glass and other old crockery here in a kitchen section. I was particularly impressed um, by this old cooler uh, there. And uh, even old dental equipment. So you can set your own office up. This uh, thing is uh, simply known as the Creature. I'm quite sure what it is, but it was wearing a football scarf. And these old TVs were just to, to die for. Absolutely love those. As was were these old couches and various curio cabinets and Art Deco lamps. Um, just wonderful. But I was here for the uh, the motoring section, and I just this is a passion of mine. Uh, old signs um from roadways and garage signs and things like that and there's there's a heap of them here uh, an old license plates and that kind of thing and next up which actually blew my mind to find a north american spec ami 6. this one is i think it's 1964 and it's been repainted it wasn't originally this color apparently it's a 1965 ami 6. Um, this has got the interconnected uh, suspension um, so the suspension system was separate on one side of the car. It was interconnected between the front and the back, and there was two, two different systems, essentially. It's a very early car. The very early cars, of course, had the uh, sliding windows. Citroen 2CV mechanicals, of course, in this. But uh, the North American models were equipped with four sealed beam headlights and the uh, raised indicators. Um, and then, of course, uh, these uh, sort of more bolstered bumpers. Now, <clears throat> only the sedans were sold in North America. This was before they added the, uh, the wagon. And the wagon, of course, were ton to be sold in Europe until uh, about 1977 and um, it latterly it had a four cylinder version which was the super the Ami super got fully independent suspension um, 
yeah, it was known as the world's most comfortable medium class car. So, as you can see, that speedometer is in miles per hour. And it's a Canadian car, but this is from an era, it's from 1965. That's before Canada went metric. And I can't remember when they went metric, but it was after that point in time, which is why that's Imperial. Um, this one has got the old 602. I think the A8 went up to 652cc. Um, and then the Super Ami. Let's put this a little bit wider. The um, the Ami Super, of course, was the four-cylinder one. They were last of the line, but this is such an early car. But what was interesting about the Ami is that it was used uh, for the development of the co-motor Wankel engine and that was a joint venture with NSU and they called it the birotor and they initially put it into a version of the AMI called the M35 which was a coupe version on I'll flash that up on the screen um, that they built like 850 of those and they were basically given to existing Citroen customers they had a job getting them all back um, but they went ahead, even though it wasn't successful, they went ahead and put that engine into the GS, into the Birota. It was an enormous flop. It was highly unreliable. It was very thirsty as well. And the warranty claims pretty much sunk Citroen and, when, and it uh, sent them into bankruptcy in 1974 when PSA effectively partnered with them and ultimately bought Citroen in 1976 they tried to get all those GS pyrotas back and again unsuccessful in doing so and they only built like 850 of those uh, pyrotas so but yeah um, the AMI uh, despite its humble beginnings was um, basically a test bed for what was to come Now, the Yugo we saw earlier was uh, famously imported by uh, industry uh, magnate Malcolm Bricklin, who uh, devised his own sports car, the uh, Bricklin SV1, in the 1970s. Likewise, uh, another motor industry stalwart, John DeLorean, who uh, started his career at Packard and then in the 1950s moved on to GM working for Pontiac as an assistant to the chief engineer. Devised his own car as well in the 19, late 1970s and it was this, the DeLorean DMC-12. Obviously made very famous by the movie Back to the Future. These were all built in Northern Ireland. Um, it was not a success in terms of a business venture. And the reason it wasn't a success was its price. This was intended to compete against the uh, likes of the Porsche 911 and the Jaguar XJS even. But um, it had an intended starting price. And they were all out of the factory, brushed aluminium. Now, his intended starting price of about $12,000. But when he actually came to market, it was more than double that. And it was extremely expensive for what it was. And so they only built around 8,000 of them. So there is an information sheet on here, which is handy. It says here, actually, yeah, 8,000. And an additional 900 were assembled in Columbus, Ohio, by Consolidated Stores, which runs a, a bric-a-brac chain called Big Lots. Well, not bric-a-brac, but discount store chain. When they purchased the company's assets using Irish workers in 1983. That's interesting. And I don't know if this is one of those final 900 or if it, this one is a Northern Ireland car. Um, these used the old PRV engine. Um, the uh, 2664 unit actually by the time this came out it had been upgraded to 849cc and that ended up in the the Volvo 260, the Volvo 760, the Peugeot 604, the Peugeot 605 and uh, Citroen, no not Citroen, the Renault 30 
Um, and then I think your version went into the Safran as well later on. Um, the Renault 25, sorry, not the Safran. Um, but very, very interesting car, this. Um, it's great to see it here, and it's great to see it amongst this little collection. Um, really super, super surprised to see an Ami here. But, uh, yeah, so... We've got a Kawasaki motorcycle in here. I know nothing about motorcycles as a rule, so there's a motorcycle. But yeah, it's just so cool just to see all this in this particular room, all this motoring memorabilia with all manner of old signs in here. These are going to be the old like um, ceramic signs and porcelain signs. Some old editions of uh, Road and Track. I like that Route 8 sign. Is that for sale? Route 8 is a local road. It is for sale. I absolutely love this traffic light. I have a traffic light in my car barn, but not as not a four-way one like this. That is fantastic. And that's a really good price too. All sorts of old license plates, hubcaps, and I love my hubcaps. I've got several old, I've got some old Buick ones like that, just like that. But uh, absolutely phenomenal room this is. If you're a car guy and you want to see a really cool room, or if you're into antiques in general, come out here. Next is a Jaguar. XK120. Yep, this is the car that put Jaguar on the map. It was called 120, of course, because it would reach 120 miles an hour. Now, I didn't know that the, the 120 had a hard top. It was available with a hard top. I thought that was the 140, but this is a 120. Um, and this has been loaned to the collection as well. It's been it's fully restored. Um, it's just beautiful inside. And uh, the the 120, of course, was the fastest production car in the world when um, it was first designed. The 120, of course, being named after its 120 mile an hour top speed. Um, what's interesting with Jaguar, of course, is that this engine ultimately remained in production for almost 50 years. Um, Jaguar only brought out three engines between the point in time when this came out, which was like 1950 or so, and um, 2000. And uh, the X12, which was basically a derivative of this. And then after their acquisition by Ford, they brought out the AJ8, the V8 series of engines. But the, the 6 was constantly improved. Uh, it's essentially the same XK uh, engine that's in my 1985 Sovereign. And then, of course, uh, in the mid 70s, the AJ6 was a much improved version, uh, which went into the XJ40. And it's in my XJ40 and my XJS as well. I love these details. Just look at that roof line. Very, very echoed Jaguar silhouette right through into the 60s with the Mark II and the S type and the Mark 10. Um, and then, of course, revived with the new S type in 1998. So, anyway, that's all from me. I'm Darren, and this is Auto Atlantica.